Good morning. And I can say uh, maybe a little bit more about uh, Bhikkhu Sujatu who's coming here on Saturday. Uh, he's one of the great uh, translators of the teachings of the Buddha. He's also a very uh, learned monastic and has considered, reflected on the Dharma <clears throat> in all kinds of areas of life and um, been very supportive of the ordination of uh, women as bhikkhunis, as nuns, and a f- fascinating man who lives in Australia. And so to have him here is kind of unusual and, and uh, kind of special to have him. So his Saturday day long should, I think, should be a fantastic event. So, um, equanimity is one of the great gifts of mindfulness practice. As the mindfulness practice is uh, developed and sustained over time, uh, sooner or later people will discover their capacity for equanimity uh, in the face of all kinds of challenges. And it'll be feel like something, not only something that safeguards them from making mistakes, but something that's very nourishing, supportive. The, um, some people might not call it equanimity, they might call it calm. They said the calm is the great gift of the practice or peace. Um, but what makes it equanimity uh, is a variety of things, but one of them is the capacity to be non-reactive to what goes on. So it's rather than being calm, it's the ability to be calm and not be uh, driven by all kinds of uh, fears or anxieties and desires and things that go on. There's a a wonderful equanimity story that comes from Japan, Japanese Zen Zen, uh, story of a priest named Hakuin who lived about 200 years ago. And the way his story is told is that um, in his village, he had a temple, and it's a small temple, and there was a small village, I guess. And in the village, there was a, a, a young woman, a teenager, who was still living at home with her folks. And uh, she got pregnant. And the parents asked, you know, do you have to tell us who the father is? And she insisted. But she didn't want to sit, tell, tell them that it was her friend down the street, you know, another teenager, and get him in trouble. So she said, oh, it's the village priest. <laughs> And um, so when the baby was born, the parents uh, brought the baby to Hakuin and um, said, this is yours, and handed it to him. And he said, is that so? And proceeded to take care of the baby. And it, but, you know, I think he lost his reputation in the village. And it was, you know, probably a difficult time. But so he just took care of the baby. And then after some months, the girl... Uh, kind of uh, regretted what she had done and I guess missed her baby and so she went to her parents and explained who the real father was and uh, so the parents came back to the temple and said we're here to take the baby back but now we made a mistake and uh, accusing you of this and uh, so he said oh is that so and handed the baby back so you know you can imagine for a, you know temple priest in a village that story like that would be quite challenging and for his reputation, for his livelihood, for all kinds of things. And his sleep, probably, if he was an old man. All kinds of things, you know, that he's only taking care of a baby. But uh, So his equanimity around that, his acceptance of that, and uh, not protesting, but just uh, going along and maybe supporting the girl in that way and supporting the village and not being reactive and angry and or something. So, uh, <clears throat> is that so? I think the American uh, word f- uh, for equanimity is okay. It's okay. But uh, is that so? You know, all kinds of things happen. Is that so? To meet the world with, is that so? First and foremost, as opposed to, oh, <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, is that so? Okay, let's look at that. The um, equanimity, uh, some, one teacher said that equanimity is, this, uh, is the peace at the center of the world. And uh, I like that expression, uh, the peace at the center of the world. And, um, and you know, so that, where is the center of the world? It, I think the implication is that it's in you. So at the center of your world is right somehow inside and then, 
and that the peace that's there, peace that can be there, uh, that is the equanim- that's a source of the equanimity. And um, it's uh, so hard to lose that peace. I mean, it's so easy to lose it. It's so easy to not be centered in some peaceful place um, and see the world through our peacefulness. Uh, it's easier to, for many people to see the world through their agitation and uh, through their reactivity, through their fear, through their desires, through their frustration. Um, and, um, and, uh, and we see a very different world depending on which eyes we have or what lens that we have, the place that we see from. And, um, and if we're centered in equanimity or in peace or some kind of non, place of non-reactivity, then in a certain way, uh, we're in charge, you're in charge. But if you're agitated, uh, restless, agitated, caught up in all these things, it's all too easy to be that the pirates have taken over the ship. And, uh, and you're not really in charge anymore. What's in charge is your desires or your frustration or your fear or your anger. Or suddenly, that, that's, what's, you know, that's what's driving the engine. That's what's driving the ship is uh, these things that, um, that uh, maybe you'd rather not be in charge. Though what some people identify, so identify with what they want, so identify with their emotions and their thoughts, that when they are hijacked by anger or fear or doubt or desires or greed, all kinds of things that can come along, um, it doesn't occur to them that they have lost control. For them, they are in control because they are those things. And, but actually, when you, the gift of mindfulness is that if you really settle on yourself deeply, you actually feel that now something has come along and taken over that doesn't really feel like it's really you. It doesn't really feel like that's who you really are, kind of at the heart of it or at the center of this world. And it can feel like you're hijacked, you know, please. And um, it's possible to uh, have enough mindfulness and stability uh, to have all kinds of things occur and not be reactive to it, not be agitated by it or caught by it, pushed around by it. And uh, in Buddhism, we have a teaching of what's called the eight worldly winds. And uh, these are things that's possible to be equanimous about. It's possible to say, oh, is that so? So, for ex- so the first two are praise and blame. So if someone praises you, is that so? If someone criticizes you, blames you, oh, is that so? Really, that's my baby? <laughs> <laughs> is that so? And um, as opposed to many people, you know, as soon as you start uh, praising someone or blaming someone, you know, they listen. You know, it's a lot of people, a lot of people, you know, there's a lot of energy around praise and blame. It's a very sad social thing that if a person has, has no bearing on a person's praise and blame, uh, then they're kind of uninteresting and the person will kind of move on to the next person because you know, you know, you, you know. Somehow that that's where the energy is. Defend yourself from criticism or take in, be nourished by the praise. But if you get neither, some, you know, it gets you know, it's kind of dull maybe. But with a, with a real strong practice, the gift of this equanimity is to feel a vitality and a vitality, a fullness, a a, a, a kind of contentment that doesn't depend on praise or blame. And so praise and blame are seen as, so, you know, they can come and go, and this is not, I'm not centered on it. I'm not basing myself on having those things. I'm already based on something that feels really good and satisfying. I don't need to base my life on those things. So praise and blame comes. And then there's success and failure. And, you know, and some people base their life on these ideas of success and failure, partly some people because they want to, their, their family or their friends or their community or the whole world has to kind of see that they're successful. And, um, and uh, the last thing they want to do is seen as a failure. Some f- families growing up, failure is kind of unforgivable. Like you can't do that, you can't fail, you have to kind of succeed. And so um, the best schools, the best this, the best everything. And... Um, but if you base your life on success and failure, then it's not a very stable life. If you base your life on the peace that's at the center of the world, 
uh, if you have a sense of this deep satisfying contentment just to breathe and be here in the world in a peaceful way, then uh, success and failure doesn't have so much sting, doesn't grab you so much. Success is nice if it's the right thing. Uh, failure is nice if it's the right thing. <laughs> and um, But success and failure, so success happens, is that so? Uh, failure happens, is that so? And then uh, the next paired wor- worldly wins is um, uh, pleasure and pain. And uh, pleasure can be nice sometimes. Pain is not necessarily so bad sometimes. One of the gifts of mindfulness practice for me has been a much higher capacity to be at ease with physical pain and uh, emotional pain as well. And uh, I would say that when I was younger, uh, I was pushed around by pain quite a bit, avoiding it, running away from it, being angry with it, attacking it, um, you know, hiding from it, all kinds of things. And life has been a lot simpler with now that I don't feel so reactive to pain. Pain arises, and oh, is that so? Okay. And uh, one of the things that uh, happens when I have this equanimity around pain is that I can study it better. I can actually be more responsible for it because I can take the time to look at it and see what's really going on here. Does there something need to be adjusted or changed? Uh, or, or some other, some, what needs to be done here? What's required? But if I'm reactive and cut up and anxious and angry and hot around the, it and feel like it's a you know, personal failure that I should have pain, uh, then I can't, don't have the ability to see it clearly and study it which I think is a respectful thing to do with pain. And then pleasure, you know, some people are driven by pleasure. For some people, pleasure of all kinds, sensual pleasures, um, are really a substitute for all kinds of uh, personal psychological needs. And the drive for pleasure, to get pleasure, to have pleasure, is not a, not, often not a simple psychological thing, motiva- uh, motivational thing for human beings. But chances are that most of the strong drives for pleasure and comfort do not come from a place of being the center of the world where there's peace, the place where we really feel like we're complete. And and, um, and so uh, to have pleasure come, there's nothing wrong, not not necessarily wrong with pleasure, um, except maybe how it comes, where it comes from sometimes. But um, to, so is that so? Okay, okay, I'm okay with this. I'll take it now. Uh, and um, So um, the other day someone fed me some food and it was clearly one of the foods my family knows that I really don't like. <laughs> it's, one of, it's one of those, it, it, there's a kind of a, we kind of playfully tease each other at home around my issue around this food. And, <laughs> And how everybody else in my family loves this food. So it's like a real thing, right? And so I came home and I said, guess what? You won't believe what happened today. (laughs) She said, what? I don't know. (laughs) Um, I ate it. (laughs) Someone served it. So I ate it. You know, it was okay. Is that so? You know, it wasn't exactly pleasant, pleasant, but oh, is that so? Okay, well, that's that, that's the deal. <laughs> and um, I remember when I was maybe 11 or 12, I was eating at a friend's house, and and for dessert they served some kind of chocolate pudding, and I don't know what you can do to chocolate pudding to make it awful. <laughs> But I didn't have much equanimity. I had no sense of, you know, stay present and understand. And I didn't have any social abilities to figure out what to do. So, so I took one bite and I said, I got to go and left. <laughs> so, you know, there's equanimity and there's a lack of equanimity. And um, and the last of the worldly wins is uh, fame and disrepute. It's different than praise and blame because praise and blame is more to do with, you know, what you're in the moment. But fame has to do with your reputation kind of out in society and the world. For some people in some societies, that's actually quite important for people. 
And so, it's, you know, to, to um, you know, if your happiness and well-being and sense of self is dependent on how many uh, people you have on your Instagram account or your Facebook account, how many likes you get, uh, the chances are that you're not very centered in some kind of inner sense of well-being and peace. That you haven't found some place to rest inside of yourself where you feel complete. You feel at ease with yourself, comfortable with yourself. And so certainly there can be fame, certainly there can be disrepute. Sometimes it's warranted and sometimes it's not. And uh, and people get very reactive to it. Some people are very protective of their reputation. Some people spend a lot of time creating reputation or broadcasting it or protect, you know, protecting it. And, you know, it's, it's not a terrible thing to have a reputation. It happens. And it maybe it's not a terrible thing to safeguard it somewhat and to protect it to, within reason. But to do so with equanimity, to do so with, oh, is that so? And um, the, uh, oh, so that, oh, that's how they see me. Oh, okay. And I can tell you it's different if you'd like to know. So um, the it's, is that so litmus test? Are you able to go through the world first and foremost and say, oh, is that so? And what's the advantage of that is that if you can say something equivalent, is that so? Or if you prefer, well, okay. Well, okay, that's how it is. Not to uh, condone it or accept or anything, but in order to uh, take a second look, to take it, is that really so? Let me take it, let me consider this. Is this something that I should be caught by? Is this something I should be concerned with? Um, is my reaction that I have right now, is this the reaction that I want to have? When I react this way, where am I coming from? Am I really coming from that centered place, the place of peace inside? Or am I coming from my agitation? Am I coming from my, my defensiveness? Am I coming from my, uh, you know, my sense of um, entitlement that I should be able to get whatever I want? Am I coming from my frustration? Am I coming from my desires that are being frustrated? Um, we want, you know, people, you know, most people want something and the world is brilliant at not providing it to us 100% of the time. So, you know, if it was 100% of the time, then, you know, you'd be so happy. But, uh, I'm sure, but uh, it turns out that, um, we, you know, reality is not going to provide you with 100% of your desires. So I know that's bad news. Maybe you never thought about it before. You never realized it. They didn't tell you at school that you know, you're not going to get all your desires satisfied. And now you're going to get depressed because you thought that's what the name of the game was. But, you know, there's a percentage of your desires that are not going to be satisfied as you go through life. So the question is, what are you going to do about that? One possibility is just refine your desires. <laughs> get better ones. Get more. Because if you have more, some of them will work. <laughs> so just, you know, like you cast more seeds, you know. Or find that place inside, the peaceful center of the world. Or if, you don't, if the, world, the idea of a peaceful center of the world doesn't speak to you as a reference point for something meaningful, uh, what center of the world inside of you do you want to come from? That you know where you feel complete or satisfied or feel like that's a place where you're nourished. That if you go through the world, that you're not pushed around by things. You're not hijacked uh, by your feelings, your emotions, your everything. So as we do mindfulness practice, I, I said that equanimity is the gift of mindfulness practice. As we do mindfulness practice, we learn how to attend, track, monitor uh, what goes on inside of us. It, that with time, it becomes second nature to do that. Um, there are people who start mindfulness practice and th you tell them to be mindfulness of their thinking or mindfulness of their emotions. And there are occasionally people who say, I have no clue how to do this. It doesn't make any sense to me what you're saying. But over the time, sometimes it takes a few years, uh, we are able to begin monitoring and noticing there's a thought, I'm having a thought. 
there is an emotion. And to be able to be equanimous about the thoughts that we have is really, really important. Just, oh, that's so. One of the gifts that my father gave me when I was about 13, I think, uh, was he had one of these father-son conversations, and he said, Gil, as you go about your life, from time to time, you're going to have bizarre thoughts. This is, this is uh, normal, he said. This is what happens time to time. And, um, and I said, oh, okay. I didn't think about it much, except that um, occasionally I did have some bizarre thoughts. And, but more important than that, i have been kind of forewarned that this was normal. It was okay, rather than horrified or upset or something about it. And so to kind of normalize it makes it a lot easier to kind of not give into it or not get agitated by it or get swept away by it or something or hijacked by it. And um, so to be able to see a thought and just see it as a thought, it's a phenomenal thing. To see a thought just as a thought. Have you ever considered what a thought is? Uh, most people will see the many people will see the world through the filter, the lens of their thoughts so thoroughly they don't even realize that what they're seeing is really their own thoughts, is the projection they have, or the judgments they have, or the assumptions they have of what they're seeing. And um, and, uh, and so we live in a world where thoughts, you know, are, we kind of saturate or paint the world with all kinds of thoughts and ideas and assumptions of what goes on, bias that goes on. And, uh, but it's powerful. It gives you a lot of personal power to be able to be calm and centered and watch thoughts arise and say to yourself, well, that's, is that so? That's just a thought. And uh, I do this regularly. I have thoughts about things that bizarre thoughts, you know, that, you know, someone um, doesn't do something that I thought they would, should do, and, and I go, oh, how could they do that? I'm frustrated, and what kind of person is that? And that was, you know, thoughtless, and you know, all these, you know, train of thoughts about that, or that person. And, or I could have this thought, you know, the person didn't do it. Maybe the person was thoughtless, or, you know, I know something. And if, oh, look at that, Gil. I kind of I look up, kind of. If my thoughts are up, so I look up. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I said, is that so? <laughs> is that so? And uh, I don't know. And, uh, and, even, and then the more interesting question sometimes is, even if it's true, even if the judgment, the thought, the realization, the understanding I have is true, I have a thought and understanding that arises, even if it's true, is that worth getting contracted around? Is that worth getting uh, all hot about? Is that worth, uh, is that appropriate? Is that something I want to really get my thinking to speed up and to make that the focus of my thoughts for the next 48 hours, you know, spinning and spinning ideas? And through mindfulness, you can almost like ask yourself that question and say, well, actually, it might be an accurate thought, but you know, it doesn't really matter to me that really I'm 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 pretty happy. And we'll I'll deal with I'll deal with this person when I see the person. We'll have a conversation about it. But I don't have to now spend all this time thinking about it and guessing and wondering what happened and being upset. Um, I don't I don't my capacity to be upset doesn't have to be hijacked by what I think that person did. Why should I sacrifice? that, you know, let's save my upsetness for better things. Upset. Is upset related to the word settled? I, I don't know what the language are, but so, and the, so then um, so to be equanimous, to develop a capacity to see your thoughts come through, see them and not latch on to them automatically or not be pushed around by them, not by be driven by them and not identify you know, not assume that because you think it, it's you. You know, it's true. It's just a thought. So what is a thought? It's a fascinating topic. What is a thought? Because we, many people don't really reflect on it. And they give a lot of authority to what they think. As I said, I think I said this maybe last week or something, that one of the leading forms, uh, sources of, of depression is rumination. 
which means we have a particular relationship to our thoughts. We've granted thoughts certain authority, granted thoughts certain power, uh, a, rela a relationship to who we are, are we to, to the thoughts. And to be able to be mindful of thoughts and see it clearly and say, oh, is that so? Oh, there's a thought. You know, it's just a thought. So the other area of equanimity is around emotions. And uh, emotions can be sublime and some of the very rewarding aspects of the human life and a very important part of it. The, um, and I kind of feel like all, all emotions should be respected. That all emotions are, at the minimum, they're kind of information about what's going on. And so to stop and look at our emotions or attend to them uh, gives us access to greater information of what's really going on in, in ourselves and the world around us. So all, res all emotions should be respected, but some emotions shouldn't be acted on. Some emotions shouldn't uh, hijack the ship and, uh, you know, run your... And uh, some emotions can be a source of, ac of agitation that people have. Some people are embarrassed by some emotions. Some people, the force of the emotion is so strong that they take over and take over our thinking, our perspective on life. And, you know, it's, sometimes it's hard to control oneself when, when there's some emotions going on. Um, and so the gift of mindfulness is to be able to see you're having an emotion clearly enough to rec know, know how to be mindful of emotion so that you are respecting, you're not denying it or belittling it or, or you know, making, your, you know, making yourself less of a human being by being mindful of emotions. You're actually in some ways making yourself more full, more complete as a human being because you have a wider sphere of, of or for, you're, you're aware of yourself in a wider, bigger way. If you're only caught up in an emotion, that's when we become narrower and, and some smaller. So to be mindful of emotion, to step back and be aware of it. And is that so? And then to respect an emotion is to question, you know, is this maybe appropriate to have this right now? Uh, it's been said now by a number of people, uh, I guess, uh, that um, we have a culture that seems to be um, depression averse. And uh, somehow depression is considered really something terrible. You shouldn't be depressed. And if at all costs you should, or for all pills, you should, you know, figure out how not to be depressed. Sometimes depression is debilitating and medical care is really needed. Sometimes it's debilitating and it's, uh, psychological care is really important. But sometimes depression is just something is working itself out in us. It's actually important to be sad sometimes or to grieve sometimes. And to be able to have the ability again, part of what mindfulness can provide, the ability to not be overwhelmed by strong emotions, but to be able to make space for them and hold them and not kind of be reactive to them or be, be, um, be discouraged by them or frustrated by, the, by they're there, that can allow some of the deeper movements that sometimes need to come out through these so-called difficult emotions to begin working themselves through us and for us to discover and understand ourselves in a deeper way. So to wake up one morning and, you know, feel lousy, oh, is that so? No, oh, is that so? Okay, okay, that's what it is today, as opposed to, oh, no, uh, you know, this, this, this can't be, not again, or something. Or I'm just going to, you know, it's, this is, to have this emotion is just too embarrassing to be in public. But, you know, people will have judgments about me and, but to be mindful of the emotion, then also you're probably less likely to have it spill out too much. And I've, I've told people sometimes, you know, that um, just let them know so that they give me a little bit of space. Because I'm giving myself that space. Through, through as, um, <clears throat> you know, I'm kind of grumpy today. And I don't think it's a crime to be grumpy. But, you know, it's a little bit awkward sometimes socially. So just tell the people. And, uh, and then hopefully it goes easier. And um, so to be equanimous about the emotional state that we have is also a great thing. So, um, so mindfulness is kind of it's a gift of mindfulness. You do mindfulness enough and start seeing more clearly, seeing more clearly, become more equanimous. 
the word, the Pali word, the ancient Buddhist word for mindfulness is upekka. And the u, pa, upa of upekka means towards something. And the ka part of upekka is, uh, comes from the word to see. To kind of, so it's kind of like having an overview of something. Some people talk about it having like a bird's eye view of the situation. And, um, and so sometimes uh, what the gift of mindfulness, of seeing clearly, is allows us to step back and have a, a broad overview of what's happening here, rather than be caught by the details or the particularity of the moment. And part of that overview is of the bird's eye view is to understand that um, it's just now. You know, it's just for this minute, it's just for this hour, just for this day. You know, oh, it's just, it just, this is how it is now. I certainly have the capacity of uh, what's called the delusion of permanence, is to feel something, and somehow there's, I don't know what gene there is inside. I don't know where it is, how, what, what it, you know, it seems like it's kind of like in there. As a, I don't know, it just comes with the operating system, I guess. Um, sometimes I get this feeling that, you know, the feeling I have is, this is forever. <laughs> My mind knows better. <laughs> uh, you know, I know that it's not going to be forever. If you ask me, how long is this going to oh, it's going to be over in a few minutes or a few hours or something. But the, the, somehow there's a biological, physical feeling <gasps> that's kind of like, oh no, this is going to be forever. And when I was younger, that feeling would get translated to thoughts as if it was going to be forever. But now, with the mindfulness that uh, has come, I kind of, oh, just, oh that, there's that feeling. It's a feeling it's going to be forever. It's impermanent. And so I have the ability, okay, that's interesting. So that's kind of an example of having an overview of a situation. That's how it is. Some people step back and have an overview of difficult situations, and they realize that there are, really are 100% other human beings involved. What I mean is by that is that they have their challenges and sufferings and their emotions and their situation and they're maybe even trying to do their best as opposed to they're only 10% human beings in how I see them because I only see them through their grumpiness or something or only see them because they just said something unkind. That's the, Everything gets reduced to that. But to step back and get the bird's eye view of the situation of the person and be willing to kind of be broad in the scope include so much and not allow that the loss of equanimity can go along with the loss of that wide scope of attention. So um, I'll offer you uh, one practice today. If you're interested in finding some equanimity at a challenging time. And um, it, it it doesn't have to take longer than 10 seconds, maybe 15, depends on how you do this. So, you know, but if you, if you happen to have that much time, <coughs> you, you know, you, you can try. I'm sure you have a lot of important things to do, so <laughs> fitting it in. <coughs> and that is um, <coughs> uh, take a, <coughs> uh, a three breath journey. Take a journey with three of your breaths, which means <clears throat> maybe close your eyes if it's appropriate socially, and, um, and then just give yourself over as fully as you can to just hang out with three breaths, three inhalations, three exhalations. Just really kind of enter that world, enter the body that's breathing. As much as you can, settle into the body. Give yourself over to that the best you can, and let your thoughts, whatever your concerns are, be in the background. And take that journey. It's a journey. It's an amazing journey. And three breaths, <clears throat> if you really kind of give yourself over to the journey of three breaths, you'll be different when you come out of that journey. Maybe not dramatically different. You probably won't be enlightened yet. <laughs> but uh, you might have a little bit more of a bird's eye view of the situation. You might have tapped into some place that's calm or more settled inside. You might have realized that I was really caught up in my thoughts here and swirling in all my thoughts. You might realize, wow, those, these emotions are strong. 
and they're still here, but you know, I was really being pushed around by them. And you might be able to, might, after three breaths, actually be breathing in a little bit more settled way. You might be, if you're not at your the peaceful center of the world, you might be in its neighborhood, which can help. So equanimity. Is that so? Maybe you'll have occasion today to say, is that so? So, we have about five minutes before the usual end. If anyone wants to ask a question about this, or please. Hi, I'm uh, this is Chris. I'm Chris. Uh, it's good to see you, Gil. Um, every time I come here, whatever topic is being addressed, it's already something that's on my mind. It's quite bizarre. Um, I'm having equanimity about it or attempting to, but equanimity has been on my plate this week. And um, ironically, I've been... I often come with my dad, and he was running late and said that he doesn't come if he's late ever, and I, he's been that way his whole life. And I said, well, this is an opportunity to be flexible, blah, blah, blah. We get into that discussion. But I told him um, I need to go because I want to maintain my equanimity, and <laughs> this is something that I've committed to, um, trying to come every Sunday. and. He called me rigid, and I, I said, he was rigid if he's on this time thing, you know, like, you can't come five minutes late because you've been that way your whole life. Okay, who's rigid? And we get into this little thing that's just my dad and I, and it's always with much love. But I found that I was really wanting to assert my equanimity or my <laughs> my desire to be equanimous and it's become the strongest desire that I've had right right now in the present time and I told him I refuse to give up my equanimity <laughs> and that is why I have to go to Gills I have to be there it is something that I have to do and I hung up the phone and said I'll see you after so that's, that's what I, you mentioned, desire, as one of the eight um, wins. And so if the strong desire is to be equanimous, yeah. right, it gets a little muddied. Um, and I don't know that I necessarily have a question, but based on the laughter, I imagine that some people can relate. What, is there anything you can offer us in response oh, to this great. silly little anecdote. I, I think, I think the, the first thing I would like to offer you is my appreciation of you for having such a strong, firm idea. I'm going to, my equanimity is really important. I'm going to, to protect it, to, to, to cultivate it, to be with it. Um, and, you know, this is really, it's really good that you do that. Um, I see this as a really healthy thing for you to do. It, it, it's possible that you're a little bit rigid with it. It's not a crime, and uh, it might be developmentally a very important stage for you to assert yourself and to find that, and not give in to the usual habits that have, you've been doing maybe for, you know, decades, that didn't serve you, and now you're asserting yourself to find a different way, and initially it might might be a little bit harsh or strong or maybe even rigid, so I just want to appreciate that what you said and what you're doing and. And, um, and then uh, if you do it, if there are some ways in which doing it is a little bit off, the mindfulness will work it out over time. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be too concerned and, uh, that you're doing it a little bit off. You're allowed to be off. <laughs> it's a good, just, you know, you're just, you know, it'll work itself out. So uh, it's possible that, um, so in, that's the main thing I wanted to say. The second thing I could say perhaps it's possible that uh, it's clearly this is something that's very important for you, and you've you've identified it with the word equanimity. So I don't want to take that away from you, mm -hmm. but there might be more to it than equanimity, and it might be if you can uh, uh, fill it out a little bit more. What else? What really good thing is in there in that little thing that you're calling equanimity, mm -hmm. and identify it. It might be easier to understand how to find your way, and it might be easier to maybe at some point have a talk with your father to explain why this is so important for you. Mm. It's possible just saying equanimity, you know, it doesn't quite, you know, 
work for some people. It's too abstract, it's too aloof, it's too indifferent or something. And, um, and so anyway, so see if you can find me, fill out the picture of what it is that you're protecting. Thank you. So maybe one more. Hello, my name is Carrie. And uh, my question is the difference when, so watching your emotions and thoughts, observing them, is this so? And letting them, you know, move on, pass through you. And when is it time, when do you know that it's time to take action? You know, so that, you know, I'm not my feelings here, but I know this to be true and I'm going to take steps, make changes to create something, you know, bring more peace. Oh yeah, so what you're asking is, is completely appropriate. And um, it's very hard though to know because so many different situations. The, the hope I have is that when we're equanimous, calm, mindful, uh, we'll, be, we're able, we'll be able to answer that question for ourselves in a better way. If we're not equanimous or calm or mindful, then uh, we probably not don't have all the information we need. It's more difficult to get the information we need to know what is needed here, and um, and uh, you know, and what we have to take into account to be able to make it, you know, figure out how to act. Um, so um, I was thinking about equanimity coming down here today. I walked. I walked down here, and. Um, and now some of you have seen, they have these uh, whole new, our street here, Hopkins, there's all this, you know, it's called traffic calming. <laughs> <laughs> so we live on a traffic calm street now. So is, is that good for us? Yeah. And um, <clears throat> every meditation center should have a calm street. And, um, but there's a, so they have these uh, temporary speed bumps. And so they have these, uh, these uh, A-frame, what are they called, uh, kind of um, stands that have um, a sign next to them, the speed bumps that say bump. So I was walking down here today, and, um, and I saw that uh, that sign had fallen down. And it's kind of a big deal because these bumps are actually kind of aggressive. I know if you, you know, I, <laughs> And you, you know, if you don't, you're not, if you don't go over slowly, they, they're not, they're not kind. <laughs> and so, and so, but I walked by it, and I kind of said, oh, you know, I should put it back up again. So first, you know, the cars that are coming, and um, and that was the first thought I had, and then I could feel and see in my mind, in my body, um, resistance to doing anything. I don't have to give you all the all the what I saw in there. <laughs> It wasn't that big a deal, but I could see this little resistance to doing it. And uh, what the equanimity did to me was uh, to recognize the resistance and, and, and not inhibit the desire to act. And so it was, and it was really easy. It was like second nature. I stopped and put it back up and it continued. And um, so, you know, when do you act? So sometimes uh, looking and seeing why we don't act is empowering. Because that, if we understand that, then it's easier to act. So anyway, that, that, that's only uh, one percent of the possible answer <laughs> to your question. But to keep asking the question, because that's a question what we're all, all of us should be having regularly. You know, when's the right time to act? What's the right way to act? Um, that's what a wise life considers. Well, thank you very much, and. Um, May equanimity bring you much joy. <laughs>